Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike. I am the American Analyst, and I am back. And today, we are going to be looking at an opinion piece from the New York Times, but more broadly, a whole new section of the New York Times opinion columnists. And that would be the America we need. And the first piece we're going to look at is the ideas that won't survive the coronavirus. If you like what I do, please be sure to subscribe to me here on YouTube and follow me on Twitter and Mice. Let's get into it. Okay, so getting right into this one, this whole series of articles, The America We Need, is part of a project from the New York Times. Uh, so far as I could tell, they had intended to do a big piece, have a lot of uh, different articles that would come together to make some kind of uh, coherent whole, and that would be about pay inequality. So as you can see here, they've got, what is it, almost 15 articles, uh, but they had to adjust basically all of them for the coronavirus. So there's a couple of there's a couple of themes that go th on throughout them: uh, pay inequality, racial and gender discrimination, typical things you would expect from the New York Times. Uh, but I'm going to be going through a couple of these, um, particularly the most interesting ones. Um, the idea that won't survive the coronavirus, that would be the first one that I'm going to do. Uh, and then I'm also definitely going to be doing stop talking about inequality and do something about it. Very excited for that one. But for today, we have the ideas that won't survive the coronavirus by Viet Tan Nguyen. The last name is definitely correct. Uh, I actually knew somebody in the army who uh, was uh, his last name was Nguyen. As a Vietnamese guy. The ideas that won't survive the coronavirus. So first off, r right away, he's only, he only talks about one thing. He only talks about one thing. So why he felt the need to say the ideas, I have no idea. What I, I didn't write it. <laughs> um, he basically spends the first few paragraphs just talking about how hard it is to be a writer. But it's actually great because he's getting a lot of work done. All right, great. Uh, what does that have to do with what you're talking about? So, <clears throat> if there's anything good, if anything good emerges out of this period, it might be an awakening to the pre-existing conditions of our body politic. I love, I've read a few of them already. I love all of the analogies to disease and to healthcare. They're just sprinkled throughout. I guess they think it makes it the reading more exciting. Uh, we were not as healthy as we thought we were. There you go. The biological virus afflicting individuals is also a social virus. Its symptoms, inequality, callousness, selfishness, and a profit motive that undervalues human life and overvalues commodities were for too long masked by the hearty good cheer of American exceptionalism, the ruddiness of someone a few steps away from a heart attack. Even if America as we know it survives the coronavirus, it can be hardly it can hardly emerge unscathed if the illusion of invincibility is shredded for any patient who survives a near fatal experience, then what then what might die after COVID nineteen is the myth that we are the best country on earth, a belief common even among the poor, the marginal, the precariat, who must believe in their own Americanness if in nothing else. And so that's where I'm going to stop initially, just the, the condescension uh, I take issue with, firstly, a belief common even in the poor, the marginal, the marginal, and the precariat. I assume that means those who are precarious, <laughs> um, who must believe in their own Americanness if in nothing else, as if their lives are so depressing. Anyone who believes that America is the greatest country on earth. Their lives must be so depressing that that is the only thing that gets them through the day. So I, I first take that is my first issue with this particular article. And I mean, I'll just I'm just going to read on. Perhaps the sensation of imprisonment during quarantine that might awake us 
that might make us imagine what real imprisonment feels like. There are, of course, actual prisons where we have warehoused human beings. Uh, those would be called criminals who have no relief from the threat of the coronavirus. And, and that actually is an issue that I just thought about. Uh, the United States Constitution protects every American citizen from uh, cruel and unusual punishments. So, is having prisoners locked up while this is going on, where there's an extreme risk that they would transmit it to one another, would that be considered a cruel and unusual punishment? Um, it would definitely be unusual. Uh, cruel, though, I'm, I'm, we all have to do it. We're all social distancing. I, I, I have no idea, but it's just an interesting thought experiment. Refugee camps and dissension pre centers that are de facto prisons. Uh, those would also be criminals. If you cross the border illegally, you are a criminal. So I'm sorry, we put you in a camp. There's economic imprisonment of poverty and precariousness. I, okay, so I was right. <laughs> uh, missing a paycheck can mean homelessness, uh, an illness, blah, blah, blah. Okay. <clears throat> but at the same time, prisons and camps have often served as places where new consciences, consciousnesses, consciousness is are born <laughs> where prisoners become radicalized become activists and even revolutionaries so is that good is it good that we lock people up so it's bad we lock them up but it's good that they become revolutionaries all right okay okay i think i think i'm, I'm following you on that one um <laughs> Is it too much hope that forced isolation of many Americans and other forced labor might compel radical acts of self-reflection, assessment, and eventually solidarity? I don't think so. I think that a lot of what I'm hearing right now is that we need to keep this social distancing going on even longer, like even past when this basically goes away, but it's kind of hanging around. That we should basically fundamentally fundamentally change our whole society to permanently social distance from one another and i take serious issue with that because already you had older people complaining that uh, you know kids never talk these days it's just go online play video games whatever and while that is i think certainly an exaggeration it is true that the amount of contact we have socially with people is very important for a healthy society and i don't think we can do that with with virtual happy hours or long, you know, calls with one another. Like you have to, you have to go out and be present in your community. So I, I really don't, I really don't think it's going to lead to self-assessment and solidarity. I definitely don't think so. A crisis often induces fear and hatred. Already we are seeing a racist blowback against Asians and Asian Americans for the China virus. I have not seen any evidence of that. I have not seen any evidence of that, that people are blaming Asian Americans for the Wuhan coronavirus, for the Chinese virus. Uh, what people are doing is blaming the Chinese government, which I think is entirely appropriate, seeing that it is essentially their fault that all this happened you either one of two things had someone at this wuhan biolab that you know by the way i said two months ago either someone at this wuhan biolab let it out or someone at the lab brought it to the wet market or perhaps it formed organically at the wet market but the thing you need to understand is these wet markets are I, I don't know how else to describe them other than disgusting. They literally have animal carcasses on the ground sitting in pools of blood that they then hack up and hand to people. So it's not entirely surprising that something like that has happened out of those conditions. And the fact that you can't call it the Chinese virus, so I, I guess then the Spanish flu is now racist as well. But hey, um, what do I know? See, I'm not even going to read this. He literally talks He literally talks about the coronavirus as a Hollywood movie. 
So he, he says, oh, right now we're in Act 1, where the hero is reluctant. But then Act 2 comes, and we, you know, face up to the enemy and defeat it. But the enemy is actually ourself. Yeah. <laughs> our real enemy is not the virus, but our response to the virus. So, yeah, turn yeah, turned, the real enemy was you all along and the big twist, but then you end up winning. So I'm not even going to read that. <laughs> America has a history of settler colonization and capitalism that has ruthlessly exploited the natural resources and people, particularly the poor, the migratory, the black, and the brown. Um, so ruthless exploitation of natural resources and people people not good but i could get on board with ruthless exploitation of natural resources to a to a certain degree because those resources are there to be exploited that's the reason it's not the reason they're there there i'm sure there's very complex geological reasons that they're not there but if we want to grow as a society if we want to continue in the future we need to exploit those natural resources, and I'm 100% for that. I feel no guilt about capitalism and settler colonization. That's how 90% of the population is here. Is They came here because America was the final war, was the last great frontier, you could say. And they came here to exploit those resources. I have no problem with that at all. Again, exploiting people, absolutely not. And there is definitely a history of that within the United States. But natural resources, why should I care if we exploit natural resources? Isn't, isn't that the point to exploit them <laughs> of a natural resource? <laughs> um, yeah, okay. Our lack of sufficient systems of health care, welfare, UBI, education to take care of the neediest among us. And he goes back to the narrative. Okay, but if our society looks the same after the defeat of COVID-19, it will be a Pyrrhic victory. So for those of you who don't know, a Pyrrhic victory is a victory that is so costly that it's almost as bad as a defeat, or you could consider it a defeat. Um, and that's based on a historical figure, Pyrrhus of Epirus, when he fought the Romans. Um, and and that's another thing, one of my problems with this article there are a few phrases and terms in here that I had to Google. Like, why write something in a way that the average person could not understand it? But, hey, whatever. We can expect a sequel, and not just one sequel, but many, until we reach a finale. The climate catastrophe. So that's one of the things I'm seeing throughout this whole The America We Need series, is that they are connecting it back to the climate. If our fumbling on the coronavirus is a preview of how the United States will handle that disaster, then we are doomed. I think that, I, I wouldn't call this the coronavirus right now a disaster. It's certainly an emergency. I wouldn't call it a disaster yet. But the climate catastrophe, I think, I think what this has done is shown that this climate catastrophe is not a disaster in any way. It, it's just been blown out of proportion hugely blown out of proportion we have when we have an actual real threat we can see how societies react the fact that no one is taking seriously the catastrophe means that it's just not really one of them so i mean i i have no problems how i have no issue with how we're handling the climate right now in fact they should be happy uh as far as i know co2 emissions are down throughout the entire world oil prices today went negative so <laughs> so if you own the gas in your car is worthless less than worthless actually <laughs> you'd have to pay somebody to take it uh blah 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 um <laughs> americans will eventually emerge from isolation and take stock of the fallen both the people and the ideas that did not make it through the crisis and then we will have to decide which story will let the survivors truly live. Survivors. Jesus. <laughs> so I, guess, uh, I guess he thinks it's going to get a lot worse. Um, honestly, with this article, I, I, find, I find it to be extremely poorly written. 
I shouldn't say that, um, unfocused, I would say. So the point of the story was the ideas which will not survive the coronavirus. And yet he dedicated one paragraph. I probably read, what, 60% of the article? He read one one paragraph was about American exceptionalism and that how it's prob- it's going to go away after, after the coronavirus. I definitely don't think that's true, but it could be true. And he gives it one paragraph. I guess it's just a structural thing. As far as his his point in the brevity with which he made it, I do think America is the greatest country on earth, but I also recognize that I probably think that because I live here. I was born here. I was raised here. I was in the United States military. I'm, I, I'm a very pra- patriotic person. So yeah, I, I do think America is the greatest country on earth, and you know I'm not going to feel sorry about that at all. I suppose that makes me marginalized. So <laughs> uh, you can include me in your marginalized group as from those who uh, believe in American exceptionalism. All right. Well, it is good to be back. My name is the American Analyst. And if you like what I do, please be sure to subscribe to me here on YouTube and follow me on Twitter and Binds. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. This is Mike, the American Analyst. Follow me on Twitter, Minds, and subscribe to me on YouTube. And be sure to hit that bell notification. I'll be coming out with new videos every single day for your viewing enjoyment. Have a good one.